This is my first business card. It identifies me as Chris Manners of Universal Export. Why would I need a business card with a false name and a fictitious company? Back in the 1980s, I worked in the construction industry in a job which bored me sideways. At the same time, I saw TV footage of Greenpeace activists herring around the ocean on small boats, placing themselves between the whales and the whaling ships. And I thought, I want to do a job like that. And so I quit my own. Remarkably, Greenpeace didn't leap at the opportunity of hiring someone with absolutely no experience of herring around the ocean on small boats. And so I went backpacking instead. But the idea of working on the environment was fixed in my brain. After a year, I returned, and I volunteered for a tiny organization called the Environmental Investigation Agency. And they would do things like carry out undercover investigations into issues like the illegal trade in ivory. My job was rather more prosaic. I sat on the floor, there weren't enough chairs to go round, and I stuffed envelopes with letters begging for money. But that job was to change my life, because I met two people, Simon Taylor and Charmian Gooch, who became, and still are, amongst my best friends. Downing lagers in the Betsy Trotwood pub just off London's Farringdon Road. We discovered we had a common bond, not just the lager. We were both interested, we were all interested in what was happening in Cambodia at that time. And what was happening in Cambodia in the early 1990s was very big news. The United Nations were mounting their biggest ever peacekeeping operation until that time. 21,000 troops were on the ground trying to bring an end to a decades-long civil war between the genocidal Khmer Rouge rebel group and the newly elected government. And we saw news reports that suggested that the Khmer Rouge were trading timber from Cambodia's rainforests with Thailand, presumably to raise money for their war. And we asked ourselves a question, is that an environmental issue? Or is that a human rights issue? Of course, it's both of those things. But at that time, no organization looked at the nexus. And then we thought to ourselves, well, if you could find out information about that trade and prove it, then maybe you could get that border closed, which would cut money off to the war and maybe end it. Why doesn't someone do that, we thought. And then we thought, why don't we? There were several answers to that question, and none of them were very good. We had no experience. We didn't know anything about the timber trade. We'd never been to the region. We had no money and no organization. But apart from that, everything was looking quite good. How would you find that information that we needed? You couldn't go to the Cambodian side of the border because the Khmer Rouge offered a reward for killing Westerners. We would infiltrate the Thai timber trade. We would pose as European timber buyers and travel the length of that 700-kilometer border, find the companies, ask them directly, and film it all with secret cameras. But we didn't have any money. Our first idea was to shake those charity collecting tins you see outside London underground stations. But there was a snag. No one had heard of us. We had no track record. And I remember standing on those damp London streets at 5 a.m. as hordes of commuters pushed past. And the five pounds a day or so that we did make, I think, was given through sympathy rather than anything else. We were not going to save the world that way. We started sending out funding proposals. We got a meeting with a second in charge at Oxfam. And as we waited in his office for him, we could see our proposal on his desk, and something was written on it. And we leant over and looked, and it said, 
will they survive? He obviously didn't think so, because he didn't give us any money. But 18 months later, Oxfam's Dutch counterpart, Noviv, gave us 18,000 pounds, and we thought, great! And then we thought, well, now we're going to have to do what we said we were going to do. So in January 1995, Simon and I landed in Bangkok. We hired a Toyota Hilux pickup truck and a translator and headed towards the border. We needed a fake identity. In the James Bond books, the name Ian Fleming gave to MI6 was Universal Export. And we thought, well, if it's good enough for James Bond, it's good enough for us. I became Chris Manners, a name I stole from a family friend. And Simon became Richard Sutton, after a school friend of his who always used to get blamed for everything. The Thai-Cambodia border was a scary place in those days. It was remote, there were very few people around, and occasionally the sounds of war would come thudding in the air from the other side, and we were very scared. Where should we start looking? The bottom right, we thought, the bottom right. If you look at a map in the far southeast of Thailand, there's a thin sliver of Thai territory sandwiched between the sea and the Cambodian border. And our logic was, well, the land is really thin, so if there are any timber companies there, they'd be much easier to see. It was a very silly idea, but it worked. On day one of that investigation, we drove down the road, the sea glistening to our right, and there on the left was this big area the size of several football pitches, stacked high with the trunks of rainforest trees. But there was no one there to talk to. The next day, feeling very tense, and with the sound of Pink Floyd's Shine On You Crazy Diamond blaring out of the car stereo, we took a dirt road towards the border in a cloud of dust. After a while, we passed a Thai military base, which made us very nervous. Then after four kilometers, we came to this big fenced-off area with plenty of people inside. And we stopped at the gate and got out of the car and thought, do we go in? Do we not? Maybe we could go back to town and have a beer and forget about all of this or whatever. But no, this is what we'd come to do. But while we were dithering around, everyone in this place had stopped work. And they were looking at us, presumably thinking, what are these two white guys doing loitering by the gate? And they were getting highly suspicious. Finally, we drove in. Simon climbed out of the car with our secret camera, which was a very cumbersome piece of equipment in those days. He walked round to my side of the car and leant in the window and said, Patrick, I'm really scared. I was feeling quite brave because I was in the driver's seat and the engine was running. And I said, Simon, could you turn around and be scared that way? Because there are two trucks coming over the Cambodian border loaded with logs. And he did, and he got the film, and it was a crucial piece of evidence. But then we made a mistake. We took out our still cameras to take photographs, and that ended in a rather undignified car chase down the road we'd come in on. But we had the information, the first bit of information. We drove three and a half thousand kilometers around that 700-kilometer border. We saw many timber companies, we asked them how much timber they imported, what they paid for it, who did they pay. And we found out that the Khmer Rouge were earning between 10 to 20 million dollars every month from that timber trade. It was funding their war. We also found out that the governments of both Thailand and Cambodia were complicit. So what to do with that information? We held a press conference in Phnom Penh, and as we were transiting Bangkok Airport on the way home, we saw emblazoned across the front page of the English-language Bangkok Post newspaper, Chuan, the Thai Prime Minister, dismisses global witness report. And we thought, now we're going to get arrested at immigration. But we weren't. We needed to get political pressure put on Thailand. 
And we thought the best route to that would be to talk to the countries backing the peace process. We started with the European capitals. London, not interested. A suave diplomat in Paris said, why are you interested in an unimportant country like Cambodia? In fact, it was the Americans in the end who put pressure on the Thai government. And in May 1995, five months after our first investigation, the border was closed. Within 18 months, the Khmer Rouge had defected to the government side and the war was over. We can't claim complete credit for all of that, but we were told by diplomatic sources that the cutting off of the timber revenue was a crucial factor. Has anyone heard of or seen the film Blood Diamond? That film arose from our second campaign. In 1998, we were looking at the role of diamonds in funding some of the most brutal wars in Africa. And as diamonds flowed out of Africa, hundreds of thousands of people were dying. And these diamonds flowing out of Africa are a symbol of peace and love. And 80% of those diamonds were bought by one company, De Beers, who had come up with this brilliant advertising slogan, a diamond is forever. You may have heard of it. Our 1998 report, Rough Trade, exposed De Beers' role in funding these wars. And a new slogan was born, Blood Diamond. So a tiny organization with a minuscule budget had derailed the advertising campaign of a global company. That was when we realized we had power. Since then, Global Witness grew. We became about 100 strong. We had an office in Brussels, we have, London, Washington, and a presence in Beijing. And we pioneered a focus on the links between natural resource exploitation, conflict, corruption, and human rights and environmental abuses. But who were we? We were just three people with no experience, no money, and a rather naive idea. Why is all this relevant? Democracy is in crisis. Truth is in crisis. And inextricably linked to those things, the planet is in crisis. At the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, world leaders pledged to reduce carbon emissions, to protect the planet's biodiversity, and a swathe of other things. 31 years later, not one of those pledges has been kept. Not one. One of the reasons for this is one of the main mechanisms to reduce carbon emissions is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. And it has been captured by economic dogma and the fossil fuel industry. At last year's meeting of the UNFCCC at Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, of the 30,000 delegates there, 600 of them were connected to the fossil fuel industry. That's more than the combined delegations of the 10 countries most impacted by climate change. It's twice the representation of indigenous people. Worse than that, of those 600, 200 of those delegates were actually on government delegations, part of the rulemaking process. And to me, that looks more like a trade fair than a mechanism to bring down carbon emissions. This year's meeting of the UNOCCC will be held in the United Arab Emirates. And the president of that meeting will be the CEO of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. What's his incentive to reduce carbon emissions? It's like having the tobacco industry at a health conference or an arms trafficker at peace talks. Thanks to the Ukraine war, actually, sorry, no, the International Energy Agency has warned that we cannot exploit any new reserves of oil and gas and have a hope of keeping global temperature rises below one and a half degrees. So why is it 
that the UK government, for example, has authorized Shell to explore the new oil reserves in the North Sea? Why has Mitsotakis here done the same thing with Exxon exploring the Aegean south of Crete? Thanks to the Ukraine war and the global energy crisis, the oil and gas companies made more money in 2022 than in any other year of their history. The top five of those companies alone made a profit of $195 billion. It's 120% more than they made the previous year. Of that, $134 billion were judged as excess profits. What could those excess profits buy? Total Energy's $22 billion in excess profits will easily cover the entire $4.3 billion the United Nations asked for for humanitarian aid for Ukraine last year. BP could pay Pakistan's $14.9 billion for climate-related flood damage and still have $3.8 billion left over. And then there are the threats to democracy itself. The information we receive, most of the information we receive now, and also the threat of artificial intelligence, the negative sides of artificial intelligence, are in the hands of a few mega corporations. Google, Facebook, Twitter. We're being manipulated by algorithms. Anger and hate spread six times faster on social media than anything else. And the faster they spread, the more money the social media companies make. If we receive our news digitally, whether we're left or right wing, it's tailored to us. If we're interested in a particular subject, like immigration, for example, that's the news we'll get. And the more we get, the more strident and the more extremist it becomes. We need to take back control. It's too easy to say the problems are too great. What can I, as an individual, do to tackle climate change or, or help end the, the war in Ukraine? All of us can do something. I hope my experience has shown that if you have the will to change something, you can, or you can at least try. Who would have thought that a young girl embarking on a lone school strike would launch a global movement? There's a tourist town in Mexico where once a week, the local population and the tourists get together and they clean the local beaches, a joint endeavor that benefits everybody. And here in Greece, Tens of thousands of people took to the streets following the recent tragic train crash. And amongst them was a young girl with a broken arm who was a passenger on one of those trains and got promptly tear-gassed by the police. With that experience, she might think she has no power to change anything. But the fact she had the courage to be there really mattered. The fact that someone told me about it, and I'm telling you about it, proves that what she did really mattered. The people of Ukraine are embroiled in a war unimaginable three years ago. But together, they're holding this powerful and aggressive invader at bay. Doing something is not always risk-free. And we have to make our own choices about that. But as the Swedish author Astrid Lundgren said in her book, Brothers Lionheart, there are things you have to do, even if they're dangerous. Otherwise, you're just a little turd and no human being. That's Astrid Lundgren. Anita Roddick, one of our early funders and the founder of The Body Shop, said, if you think you're too small to make an impact, try going to sleep in a room with a mosquito in it. Here in Athens, the birthplace of democracy seems a good place to try and start to rekindle it. 
For me, unless I get swatted by someone as an annoying mosquito, which is always possible, I'm going to keep putting out this message that knowledge matters, truth matters, collective responsibility matters. It's up to all of us. Thank you.